Thank you, Ashley. And thank you, everyone, for joining. Wow, we have a lot of folks on here. Uh, I'm not in my normal place, so we will see how well technology is kind to me today. Uh, looks like we do have it up. Awesome. Uh, so, hey, welcome, everybody, uh, to the first of three webinars that is, are all about we, you're going to learn more about gray noise tags than you ever wanted to, or maybe you have wanted to. We'll cover what the other two are going to be doing later towards the end of the presentation. Uh, today's installment, though, is designed to ensure that you fully grok or understand what exactly these tags are. Tags aren't really a common name or a common term in cybersecurity. So what are these things? Um, and you need that because the, 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 the deeper dives are deeper dives. Um, so we're gonna try to get this definition out of the way. At the end of it, you should know everything there is to know about what's in a tag, and hopefully that will help set the stage for success for later on. Uh, so you know, much like the US legislative process, however, um, the ecosystem that surrounds just how a gray noise tag is born, um, how it gets into the platform and how folks use it is pretty complex. Now, I am no Jack Sheldon of Schoolhouse Rock fame. And so I'm going to, I will refrain from attempting to sing any version of I'm just a tag to you because you, you, you can also just figure out why I'm not going to sing. Uh, but we will try to keep the conversation super light really focused and as digestible as those Schoolhouse Rock things were. Um, and we're going to keep our, our tag friend around just for company as, as we go through everything. Now, today we're going to take a journey together and this is the path we're going on. Uh, we're going to start off with just what tags are, right? Then we're going to move on to how these tags relate to what most cybersecurity folk think of or know of as detections. Uh, next, we're going to like zoom out, uh, take a bird's eye view, of the vast gray noise ecosystem and tag creation processes. Then we're gonna to try to remove any confusion around something that does actually pop up every so often, which is the terms benign, malicious, and unknown as used by gray noise, because there, there's some meaning differences than what you're probably used to in other cybersecurity products or even from within your own organizations. Um, finally, we're gonna close with just how you can use these tags, right? It's great that we have tags. It's great that the platform is here. It's great that we do a lot of awesome things at Gray Noise. But honestly, if you can't make practical use of them, then they're not that great. So we're gonna show some ways that you can take all this stuff we've learned and all the tags that we've got and how to, how to use them in your organization. So let's start off with just what are Gray Noise tags? And so that's the definition time. We have a couple walls of text. This is one of them. Uh, a gray noise tag is a label used by gray noise to categorize and provide context to the activity it detects from IP addresses scanning the internet. Okay, that's really dry, dull, and boring. It does tell you what it is, but it's, I pictures worth a thousand whatevers. So if you were to go to our visualizer, visit that gray noise that I out right now, you could go to the tags tab, type the letters, move it. It doesn't need to be case sensitive. I'm just, I, I kind of like, I need to do it that way. And uh, we're going to walk through all of the things that you see from like from the visualizer and even from the API that make up what, what, what describes a tag. So every tag, all tags have an actual readable, like to, to the degree that any tech, tech software names are readable these days, uh, name so that we humans can talk about them with each other, identify them in a colloquial context and not have to use like hex strings or slugs or with dashes and whatever in them. It just makes it easier for us to have a conversation and to communicate what's going on with, 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 with the tag. Um, all tags have some intention associated with them. Now that's that malicious, benign, and unknown that we talked about at the beginning of the presentation. And we're gonna do a whole section on that. So we're not, we're just gonna skip what those are right now. Let's put a placeholder there and we will definitely get back to it. Uh, every tag has a category and we have a number of categories. Uh, really though, these are the top four. And if I'm, if I'm being honest, the two used most at gray noise are activity and actor. Uh, the activity tag, the activity category for a tag just means that there is a particular type of activity this that something was engaged in. So think of it as making a web request, slinging an exploit at us, you know, doing something to poke at us that way. Um, we also have an actor tag, and we're going to talk a lot more about actors and how we identify them in a, a little bit later. But think of that as maybe census or showdan, and we'll talk about why I've only mentioned benign and why we tend to only like flag benign ones in the actor tool, actor tag. Uh, now, when we have malicious tags, which is the vast majority of gray noise tags, the also vast majority of the malicious tags 
are associated with one or more CVEs. I've actually got an example of a tag, a very recent tag uh, that has a lot of CVEs associated with it. I'll explain why that is when we get to that section. Um, but the fact that we have this lens CVE metadata is really great for folks involved in vulnerability management or using CVEs as part of the detection regime or the alerting regime, or it's just a way that you focus and identify things in, in your environment. Uh, we have that there so that you can do that. The one thing I will say is that there is an increasingly uh, large number of vulnerabilities that come out that are not that have zero CVEs. They're just not part of the CVE ecosystem. Uh, that's that's a discussion for another day. But right now, the vast majority of things that do come for us that we see that you have to react to are CVE based, and we've got your back covered for that one. Now, sometimes a name is not enough. As I mentioned before, some software names are really weird. You don't like move it. Like, what the heck does that thing do, right? So you don't even know what it's trying to go do. Um, so we will provide some small definition or some explanation about what the tag is. That way you have a better idea of the context around it. And you have a little bit more color um, that, that you can use for it. Um, it's not a huge wall of text. It doesn't go deep dive. It also doesn't have to go into a super deep dive uh, because we always cite sources for anything that we put as a tag in gray noise. Um, we do that because that's just how we roll. Like, we don't make stuff up, right? We are very careful about what we put into our platform and we like to document everything that we possibly can. Now, all of those sources are URLs. They exist on the internet somewhere. And another thing that we do at Gray Noise is we periodically go through all of those URLs and all of our tags to see if what's there is still there. Um, there's this thing called link rot on the internet. It's really bad. If you go through the CVE database, and try to grab all the links. I believe Todd Beardsley, who's at CISA now, uh, did a great study on that, like towards uh, at Rapid7, where it's like a weirdly odd percentage, like 20-ish, I think, or 30-ish percent of the links in CVEs are all dead. Like you can't get to them. Like they don't point to what they did before. And we don't want to add to the link rot on the internet. We want our system to be usable and a great source of record. So we will point to things in archive.org or other trusted archive sites if we do determine that a link no longer goes to where it goes. So we try to be a great source of record that you can use as and rely on for whatever you're using as metadata within your organization for vulnerabilities. Oh, and you know, if you if you need to go to the move it tag, um, you'll see really nice, beautiful vi visualization. You can dig into what's been happening with that of late. But if you scroll down a little bit, uh, you're gonna see that we also have associated with the tags, you know, when the CVE was published, if it is a CVE based tag. Um, then you're also gonna see when we created that tag, right? So you'll know when the tag was actually born, when it made it into the platform, we said this was good enough to publish, good enough, trustworthy enough to be part of the gray noise tag ecosystem. Uh, one thing that you probably will see on a regular basis is that we're, our detection engineers are amazing. We tend to almost have like a within 24 hours of a CVE coming out that we have a tag. It's not always the case. Uh, we, we might talk about that later. Uh, sometimes it's just hard to, to get a tag out right away for something. So if you do see us getting it within 24 hours, give us a high five over the internet. And if it takes us a little while, don't judge us too harshly. You should try to write some of these detections. They're, they're actually pretty hard in a lot of cases. Now, I keep, keep using the word tag. We mentioned at the beginning that you probably use that word at work unless you're talking about gray noise, which you should do like regularly at work, by the way. Um, so at work, you're probably used to calling them detections. And if you're in a large enough organization, you probably have an entire department that just centers around what's called detection engineering. Now, if you haven't heard that term before, I'm going to read another wall of text to you, right? So detection engineering refers to the practice of designing and implementing and managing systems and processes that identify and alert on potential security threats and vulnerabilities. It invite, involves creating detection rules and algorithms to identify anomalous activities, behaviors that could indicate a security breach. The goal of detection engineering is to promptly and accurately identify potential threats enabling organizations to respond swiftly to mitigate any potential damage. Um, fundamentally, that means you're, look, you're writing things that work in systems that detect bad things going on, right? I think one of the big things on there is detection rules in that definition. Fundamentally, a tag, at least the ones that are looking at activity, so exploits that are being slung or paths that are being grabbed or like, connections with logins that are being attempted, that's, that's some activity that we're looking to write a rule to actually detect. And I think one way to really like layer this home for for folks is to show like what like what the similarities and maybe differences between gray noise tags and detections that you write internally 
I also want to show that like you do a lot more work than we do because you have a lot more complex environment than we have. So gray noise. We listen on the internet. We have thousands and thousands. We'll we'll go into this later of sensors on the internet. Um, that is that is where we get all of our information from. That is where that is what all of our tags operate on. That is what all of our detection rules operate on. Um, that means that this is where our focus is coming from. This is what we see, and this is what we're reporting on to, to you. Uh, because of that, we are packet oriented, right? So this everything has to go across the wire. Uh, it may be it's going through the air these days. We did old school wire. You know, it is what it is. And that means we have to just look at what's happening on that packet level. So there is again, there's some you know, narrowing down of focus for what our tags are, are, are doing. And then when we enrich information, um, we do that based upon a number of things. One is source IP or network knowledge. Uh, we get that knowledge from things that we mine and detect or do, and we also get that from a lot of really awesome partners uh, that we do to make sure we're giving you the most up-to-date and useful information. We trust others that are good in a particular space to give us information, and we're good at what we do, and they rely on our stuff too. The partnerships are awesome. Uh, and also protocol actions. We're going to show an example of this later, so I don't want to dig into this too much right now. But this is basically anything happening over web or SSH or Telnet. Uh, things happen across that, so we care about those protocols and what's happening within those protocols, and any telltale signs in those interactions. And again, there's going to be an, a full example of this. But this think of like just seeing what the exploit is being slung over the wire to us. And then you have the same problem as we do. If you're writing detections that are based on internet things, you just did everything that applies to you. So if you're doing all that hard work by hand, you could join our team if you wanted to, because that's what we do. However, you have a lot more stuff going on. You have all your internal systems on your hopefully not flat network. Uh, there's, that's complex, evolved over time, joined together because of mergers and acquisitions. So you have a lot more com network complexity, despite the fact that the internet's pretty vast. You also have to care about process spawning on systems all across the place. You have to deal about file system activity, all the behaviors that occur within your environment, really, really complex stuff for detection rules. And your enrichments are based on more than just what we have, right? You have user information across all your vast users. Uh, you have secret sharing info from all your secret sharing partners that we don't have those access to. Um, and you know, you have previous incidents. Yeah, I, I know, I know you've had incidents. I won't tell anybody. Um, that you also use to inform the detections that you're going to make next time around. So we're a lot alike. We're also a lot different. Um, but what we try to do is have our tag be so useful that we can take away some of that internet noise detection thing and let you focus on some of that internal stuff, because that's a lot more important for some of the other ways that attackers get in than just besides the internet. All right, so now that we know a little bit more about tags, let's see how the tags fit into the overall ecosystem of tags at Gray Noise. Now, our design team does amazing work. I always say that, and I always mean it because they do. And this is a really great overview diagram, fairly easy to grok. Once we dig into it, it gets really complex fast, really fast. So we're going to tap into each one of these areas just to see like what that looks like um, and try to maybe remove some of that complexity and make it a bit more understandable because it really does get complex when, when you dig in. So as I mentioned before, we have thousands, and I do mean thousands of sensors running across the internet 24 seven from a lot of places. It's around 50 countries that we have uh, a presence in. We're trying to get more every day. Hopefully we'll be in a lot more other networks than just countries soon. Like take a look at our EAP sensors thing on, on our grainers.io site. And we do all this uh, systems we put out there and they're not just listening out of their own volition. We bait people, right? Why, what do we mean by that? We stand up either full or fake applications other web applications could be fake routers. They could be just like a log, a Unix login session, like whatever. We we do our best to look like things that attackers might want to be exploiting at any given moment in time. We do all that, and then we record everything, and I mean everything, uh, much to the chagrin of the the, the number crunchers that at Gray Noise, because we have a lot of data and we don't throw a single thing away. So I can go back to 2020 when all these things first started. I start looking at data from back, and then we we can do that moving forward with everything that we have. There's a lot of complexity in what I just said. Getting all that data, routing all that data, mining all that data, applying tags to all that data. I mean, that's what we do 24-7 to provide the visibility that you get when you look at our tags. Because of that visibility, we are usually, or at least quite often, first to see activity and pretty much always first to see novel activity. So that means if there's going to be a brand new CVE comes out, there's no exploits yet, an exploit finally comes out and we start to have things on the internet with results to that, 
we we're probably going to see it first. Not always. I can't guarantee that, but we will be really close if we're not first to see that. Um, that presence, the ability to see that and detect that and fire off, have our tags fire off things is really important. That means you are first to know if you're using gray noise. It's that simple. Um, that gives you more time to do things. It also gives you time to, or gives you some uh, leverage to get folks to buy time to patch or get folks to let you patch quickly or create mitigations quickly, or maybe even get a budget item request for redundancy so you can keep a service up while you patch it and then take it back down. Uh, lots of things that happen with this one. It's, it's like this timeliness is probably one of the coolest things of Gray Noise. I'm, I was very jealous of this when I was at a different organization and I'm glad I get to be here because now I get to be part of that solution. Um, now, humans power Gray Noise. Uh, we talked about all that technology I just, I just mentioned, but humans are at the heart of Gray Noise, not just your awesome customers and community, but also the folks internally from engineering to design, to research, and all these amazing humans like Ashley right here that are on our comms team that coordinate, help coordinate and publish these webinars, all of the information uh, packets that we give you all. Um, that We need these folks to do these things. We can't run growing eyes with it. And similarly with tags, um, humans have the final say on each and every tag that goes out at Gray Noise. No automation, just push the tag out. We don't trust the computer to network. We validate everything and we stand by what we put out. Um, this is really, really important. And these are some of the things, places that we get this information from. Uh, we have a team of, of researchers, like I mentioned before. So we do bespoke vulnerability research. We dig in, we pull things apart, we look at the hex strings, we do patch diffs, we go and look at memory of things running. Uh, you're gonna see an example of some of that later. Uh, that's really important. We dig in, we don't just wait for everyone else to tell us things. Uh, we also keep an eye on what's happening in cyber. So we will see if there's any new tools or new you know, Metasploit modules or new Nuclei modules that we have to poke at, and we make sure we cover them as well too. Uh, we also work with our partners uh, to see if there's new actors out and about. Uh, some actors would be like, you know, Census, like they're one of the great folks out there that help protect organizations, they scan the internet. We look for the folks like them and make sure that we keep up with how they do things so that we can report on them. We have a lot of great partners. Uh, Trinity Cyber and Volncheck come to mind really quickly. I don't have time to list all of them. We have a lot of awesome partners. Uh, working with them uh, means that we can collaborate on vulnerability research, get detections out more, far more qu quicker than we could have if we had just done them on our own. We also try to work with vendors, um, like hardware vendors, like fire, firewall or software vendors, like firewall vendors or some software folks. Um, they're not the most forthcoming things. They kind of think of security as the way to security. Some of them are great. Uh, for the most part, this isn't a great source for us, but we keep trying to make it better uh, just because that can help make people safer or faster. And that's kind of what we care about. Uh, we do sovereign collaboration, fancy. Um, that means sometimes like, you know, any given .gov across the globe might come and ask us things or might give us some information. And we will use that for also making tags. And we will look at the internet for proof of concept code, uh, you know, just for everyone that doesn't already know this. Don't trust proof of concept code on the internet. Do not run it in like a non-safe environment. Don't run it at all if you don't read it first. We validate everything if we're looking at a POC and we will not just trust the POC works. We'll, we'll vet it, ask it around. We'll make sure it is before we actually have a tag for it. And we have some new cool AI assisted traffic analysis and you're gonna see some of that in a second. But let's look at that, the this what I was mentioned before, protocol level things, what's occurring on the internet. This is an example of just a, a web request that, that should be coming from a form on a router that is then sent to a router by some admin that's using like the router stuff. This is for a Zyxel uh, router, modem router thingy. And uh, this, this is not coming from a human, this is coming from an automated request. And if you look at that bottom part, there's some weird things in there like, why is there like change mod and bin names and running things and wgets? This is clearly someone trying to sling an exploit, uh, trying to uh, basically trying to take over a, a Zyxel modem and trying to make that part of their botnet. Um, this actually turned into this tag. You can go there right now if you want to. It's the Zyxel P6690, you can read the whole thing. Um, the, this, this is great. And we use the patterns either in the header, because there was a weird header there, if you saw. We use some of those patterns that are in the actual body so that to, to know what's there. And that thing will then fall off. This is an older one. Um, and I don't think there's, there was an activity as of yesterday. There might be some today, I didn't look today. Uh, but you can take a look there and this becomes part of the gray noise tag ecosystem. A more recent one that's really fun, um, actually, is one from Atlassian. This is a CVE that that for a, a vulnerability in a YAML library. That that doesn't matter what that is. We we can talk about that in a deep dive in the webinar. Um, but this advisory is where we got a heads up for something. And Ron Bose on our team 
has an amazing deep dive. If you haven't read this yet, go there. Ron walked through. Uh, I mean, actually, if you want to learn how to be a detection engineer, you should just read this blog, and that's probably enough to get that you can be one right after it. If there's that information in it. Um, Ron shows exactly what this vulnerability is and all the steps that he took to go through and try to find this. And I mean that, like, this is an example of like just how far we'll go to make a tag. Ron built an application using this vulnerable library and then tried to exploit it so that we would see what happens over the wire and be able to write a really, really good tag for it. And matter of fact, Ron did. And this is one of those ones where we have a lot of CVEs associated with one. That happens. I, I really hate that. We really hate that. If there's a vulnerability in one thing, that should be the CVE. Shouldn't cascade out. But this is a you know, weird ecosystem we have in cyber. So it's this is as good as it gets. But you're covered with this one. And finally, uh, that AI stuff that I mentioned. Uh, if you go to sifflabs.graynose.io, don't believe the banner. This is open till the end of this month. Uh, this is our AI-driven threat hunting platform. Uh, we won't go into a lot of detail on it right now, but it, it found this through uh, from the millions and millions, and I do mean that, millions of un, unknown things slung our way every single day. It popped this back up, and uh, we turned that into, I think Howdy and our team did this one, uh, a G, uh, whatever GLP, this is like some obscure piece of technology, but it's something that's being slung on the internet right now. Uh, if you're on Mastodon or LinkedIn and you follow me, or, or if you want to just tap into where I am there, I also just posted something today that Howdy did very recently. We actually saw folks slinging a 1999 vulnerability um, back in November of this year, and we finally got around. It was a low priority tag, so we finally got around to writing a tag for it. Uh, definitely take a look at that, though. We see a lot of things happening on the internet. We catch it, and our goal is to identify everything. Our goal is that the packet will be unknown to gray noise at some point, and this is helping us get there. This is pretty amazing technology. Okay, so about this benign, malicious, unknown thing I've mentioned twice now. Um, this making call is a big deal for us at gray noise. Uh, we don't have the luxury of other vendors who write signatures and like toss out stuff for snort or whatever. We have to be right. Um, if we're not right, you won't trust us, pay us, and then you, I won't be doing webinars like this. Uh, and I want well, that that's good maybe because you won't hear me sing like you had to at the beginning, but but I digress. Um, we really can't afford to call something bad if it isn't bad. And the other way around, like heaven forbid something like we call something good and it's it's actually really bad. So noise classifies an IP address as benign based on the nature of the actor associated with IP. I told you I was gonna go into a little more detail on this at the end. Um, to be classified as benign, we have criteria that uh, that, a, that a, a researcher, a vendor, some source, some actor has to meet. Uh, they have to be a legit entity. We have to be able to go talk to you. Like we, you have to be a company, a researcher, known individual, but you got to be there. You got to be able to let us reach out to you. You got to be able to interact with us on a regular basis. You just, you just, you just got to be squaring up with us, right? Um, then we also have to determine you're not malicious in nature. Uh, that that's a thing. Like some people say, hey, you should be like classify us as benign. You poke around a bit. Nope, not happening. Um, and then the source IP page must have some kind of opt out functionality. Now that's we just do that because you all have to deal with a lot of things hitting your perimeter. And if you really can't deal with like what's happening from of, of a benign scanner standpoint, even with our help. Um, you should have the ability to say, please don't scan me. Um, I would encourage you maybe to flip that around and suggest that you use those folks as like someone that could help you know what's on your perimeter and do a tax service management, but that's your call, it's not my call. So this is how we actually do benign stuff or gray noise. Uh, gray noise classifies an IPS as malicious based upon behaviors that we see. So that exploit slinging for that Zyxel modem, that would be one thing that would say, yeah, that that's kind of malicious, probably shouldn't do that. Um, we we capture those in tags and uh, we classify those as malicious. And here's the thing, and this is kind of really important where things get really complex or at least a bit more sciencey here. If an IP address is not classified as benign and has at least one malicious tag, it gets classified as malicious at noise. Um, and we'll see. An ex we'll basically dig into this in a second when we talk about unknown and go through an example. We also have this unknown bucket. It's a really big bucket. Most of like a chunk of gray noise stuff is actually unknown because it doesn't meet the criteria for benign or malicious, right? Uh, this means that we've we've seen the IP address doing something, uh, but we haven't been able to vet that IP address or what that something is. Now there's 4 billion IP addresses out there. Like not all are decibel. I know we're gonna see like all 4 billion, but it's like 3.2 billion we could see stuff from. We eventually may, but we don't, like we just don't see that. So we don't know everything about every IP address. Um, so an unknown classification, you know, means we've seen it scanning or crawling, 
doesn't belong to known business services, like, you know, this like what, what you might see from a provider. Um, we just don't know what it is. And because of that, we can't make a call and we're not going to make a call until we are able to make a call. Now, unknown is a big category. And you're like, why would you even have something unknown? Well, let's take a look. Uh, back in October, we created a tag for robots.txt. I think everyone knows what that is. It's really what search, it's what search engines use to, to know what they should or should not scan on your site. Um, that's, that's great because that lets you have them find things. It's also a great flag for attackers because if you say, hey, please don't scan over here, attackers and curious security researchers are going to go scan there. So you're literally signaling things to folks that please go here, even though you're saying to other folks, please don't go here. Um, you, see in the, you see in the chart, like any given day, it's like 500 to 700 IP addresses. This is unknown. We don't know why folks are pulling robots.txt. We're not going to assume it's good. We're not going to assume it's bad. Just that tag itself for what it's doing for that activity, we just don't know. Um, and up since October, we've counted over 6,736 as of last night, um, unique IP addresses that have been pulling robots.txt on a regular basis, literally from every IP address in the Grey Noise fleet. And it's kind of amazing how thorough they are at doing that. And if we poke at that, uh, around 2,800 are malicious IP addresses. Uh, that means they've been doing other bad things on the internet. Like I said, they're going to pull robots.txt to know where to scan you. So maybe you might want to be more careful with your robots.txt files. Um, the, uh, there's a bunch of benign ones like Census and Google and things like that. And then there's still a bucket of unknown. We just don't know what they're doing. And until we, they do something bad, we will not say that they're bad. Until we know that they're good, we will not do something good. So hopefully that clears things up a little bit because that tends to be an area of confusion. Uh, so we're getting towards the end, talked about tags, gave you a little bit of depth about what's going on. How can you use them or how can you make the best use of them? Like what, what does this enable for you? And ideally, there's three different things that we're going to talk about here. You can use the API, right? And I think of active and passive. You can figure out where those categories go as we talk about them. Uh, for your SOAR platforms, your automation platforms, uh, you can have it hit the API or you know, maybe grab um, a bulk, bulk data and have it apply locally so you're not always making API calls. Um, SOAR can make automated decisions for you when they see IP addresses coming in. Might help really reduce the alert, that problem that you might have, or be able to take immediate action. Uh, we also have this really cool CLI and like, I, I, this isn't like a CLI. We're not doing like a, like, we're not going to do like any CLI or screen sharing, or whatever, but the, the, the folks that write our CLIs at Grain Eyes are amazing. They do great work. This is super pretty. And I just wanted to show you, like, this is grabbing some metadata for log4j, but you can grab all the IP addresses for log4j as well. Um, I just, I love using the CLI tools that we make, uh, even though I like making API calls directly and other things. This just simplifies things when I need a really quick view. Um, see a lot of ways to use the API and get, get useful information about our tags and apply them locally. You can use our visualizer. We talked about going there earlier to just walk, walk along with me is what I'm showing you. To hunt, you can poke around, look for IP addresses, look for tags. You can just dig into anything in our platform. It's really, it's a great capable platform for just poking and looking at a whole bunch of stuff related to what's happening on the internet. One thing though that I think folks aren't using as well as they could is when you hunt and you come to a tag and you find an IP address, you can say, hey, show me IP addresses that look like this IP address. They may not be doing stuff with that tag, um, but they may be doing other things and they, some, they may do that tag someday. Uh, by doing that, you might be able to get ahead of what attackers are doing, block or inform more IP addresses that are out there than you were before. And this is an example of, of that IP similarity. You get all the reasons why that came out to be similar. And I'm just going to bet that this one will be doing whatever it was for whatever the tag was that I had been poking at that. This is an older screenshot. Um, but this is a great way to hunt, get ahead of the game. Um, and then finally, a lot of folks, a lot of customers just, just plug us right into their tooling. SAM is a great place to do that. Really, really cuts down on the number of alerts that they have, really helps enrich things so that the events that they find and the tickets that they create are far more meaningful. Um, it's just really great. Uh, so that's how we use the quick gray noise. That's how we do tags. That's how you can use us. And uh, this is just the first one. And now that you've got a great background, uh, the next one we're going to be setting up is the 201 detection engineering under the hood. You're going to build a tag with us in that one. That'd be super cool. Uh, hopefully you get to see how some of this stuff is made. Um, you know, maybe knock on our door if you want to work here. Uh, and then the final one is going to talk more deeply about this AI thing I keep mentioning. Uh, this isn't some just AI sticker like a lot of vendors do these days. We're literally using AI to give our team superpowers. Now they might argue that against me because Thanks to AI, we have like an 85 tag backlog that we're working through um, right now. Uh, that's how that's how really solid this tool is. 
Uh, so I encourage you to go play with SIFT before this, but we'll be we'll be able to do that for, for uh, we'll be able to show you more of this and dig into it how we do this uh, later on. Um, so I just want to say thank you all for attending today, and uh, I see that there's a lot of stuff in the chat and some Q and A things. So I'm going to hand it over to Ashley to tell me what I've missed as you've been listening to me talk. Yes. So one of the questions is, uh, do IPs and tags age off? Yes, they do. Um, so we. On the, so in the visualizer, first of all, you're only going to see 30 days of activity. Um, so in our folks that have access to bulk data will also be able to go back in time and see what an IP address was. Uh, we, we do our best, though, to like make sure that if an IP address is no longer exhibiting a certain behavior, then that IP address kind of goes into a neutral zone for a while before we do it again. Before I go into like timings on those things, and I don't want to get into a lot of timing discussions here because maybe we can maybe I'll do that more in the next one as we talk about how tags are made and talk about timings and why that's important. The reason why aging off is really important is a good chunk of things that happen across the internet happen in residential IP space. And we're very fortunate in the US, if you have decent internet, you probably have the same IP address for a very long time unless you have a power outage. Uh, for in a lot, of, a lot of portions of the globe, that is not the case. Uh, the IP addresses get rotated pretty fre frequently. So a compromise, let's say compromise Netgear mode, I'm not, I'm not picking on Netgear, they just get compromised a lot. Um, might not be at the same IP address as it was the, the next time around. So we do age it off, and I will make sure to cover that in more detail in that 201 uh, 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 webinar we're going to do, just so you have an idea of what that process looks like. Yeah, great. Uh, just a reminder, if you have questions, submit them in the chat or in the, in the Q&A. We'll get to as many as we can. Um, I think you touched on this a little bit, but um, and I think we're going to cover it in the third session, but uh, will gray noise leverage AI in future tag assignment? Yes, absolutely. So as as I mentioned, um, the team is already not happy with like with me and the data science team because the SIFT tool, I mean, they're happy, like we, we have more tags to build, but we didn't we, and we, we knew it would be really useful. We didn't think it was going to be this useful. Um, we we knew it would help. It's it's overwhelmingly helping. Um, we we have a a, 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 a a we have a great problem where we have a lot of things to sift sift through after sift has already done it to be able to see that. So we are leveraging AI right now. As I mentioned, we have like and like Glenn can correct me. It's something like an 80, 90 tag backlog where we have to go through, see what sift said, look at the rules that sift created for us, augment those rules and test those rules, and then promote them to production when we know that they're ironclad and we can actually rely on them. Um, so we are using that and we are looking at the expanding from HTTP, which is where SIFT focus is right now, into virtually every single protocol through some new fancy things uh, that Daniel on the team is working on. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Yeah, AI is a big portion of this, but it's not to go do things on its own. It's not to go like it, we, we are not creating a cybersecurity stochastic parrot. Uh, what we are doing is leveraging it so that our humans uh, have don't have to muddle through literally one to three million things. That's just AP a day that we had not seen before. Uh, so it's really to help us get ahead of things and be able to identify things. Awesome. Um, well, this is kind of fun. It probably wasn't fun for you, but uh, what was the most challenging tag for you and your team? Um, yeah, I mean, there's probably a lot that fit into that category. And I don't know if I, if I can scrounge some time from Remy for the next one, I might try to just get him on to talk about that because we're going to talk about being a tag next time. Um, but this past, I want to say October, November, I don't remember, I should remember, but I blocked it out. It was so bad. Um, there was a Cisco iOS vulnerability that was really gnarly because Cisco had no patch for it for a while. Everybody was all like, Scared, like scared is the right word. Like I don't usually use that, but you could just tell everyone was on edge. Uh, the gov was on edge. Like corporations were on edge. Ven the Cisco was on edge. Uh, just just because it like routers are being compromised like crazy, and uh, it took I want to say eight days from knowing about the activity happening to working with uh, partners. I know we worked with uh, Vonecheck on this one, and I know we also worked with some working group at CISA on this one uh, to be able to get that tag out as quick as possible, but. I mean, Remy was literally pulling his hair out for for, for working with some of those things. Um, I don't envy his his time and dedication on that one. I'm glad he I'm glad we have him and he did that. But it, it it was hard and it was a mess and it was it was a long fog. So that, that I think that maybe if if that isn't the top one, it's probably in the top three. Great. All right, got another one. Uh, how many hits do you need before something becomes worthy of a tag? That's an interesting question. Um, so we so 
that actually I, I i would if we can write down who that was i'd love to have a conversation after this because if we see a malicious like string on the internet as an example like if sift is picking up this weird cluster that are happening or even just and the cluster could be like a, a cluster of one like it could be one thing slinging something that looks like a payload we've never seen before if that's a malicious payload and we can make a tech a detection rule out of that thing it will become a tag um so it, there doesn't need to be a quantity to go do that. And if an IP address is doing something bad, like that IP address is going to get a classification of malicious, regardless of however many times we've seen it before, or if we've ever seen it before, because it's hitting a particular tag. So um, tag from a activity standpoint, it, we will do that immediately if we can validate that this is actually re reproduce it and make it be 100%. Um, for all the other ones, though, like we won't say it's benign until we actually do a lot of investigation. So that's not really how many times we see it. It's more of can we find out who it is and mark it that way if if it is benign. And if that doesn't explain it more, I'll be glad. Again, if if you want to reach out or we or if I can reach out to you later, I'll be glad to do that. Awesome. Um, is there a specific strategy that works with reducing false positives and tags, or is it a combination of things? Uh, so for us, is we try to be as simple as possible when we are writing a detection rule for something. So. As, as a really dumb example, like if if there's a source going out and hitting slash, like just the root of, of a thing, we obviously wouldn't make a, 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 a malicious tag for that. We might make a web crawler tag for, as a matter of fact, that will fit into the web crawler tag because that's just something going and pinging on the internet, you know, grabbing whatever it can off of the root of a particular web server. Um, but you know, we, we will have to dig in deeper and we will want to make it as precise as possible so that we're not just being too generic and getting something that might just be doing, it might be a miss it. So I, I, let, me, let me make it a little more real. Um, it, someone may be trying to configure a piece of web stuff over the internet that they thought they had that IP address before, but they don't. This happens way more often than folks want to know in Google Cloud, AWS, Azure, all these big cloud providers. Folks don't realize that they they don't have that IP address anymore, or someone may be reading documentation in in their organization, doing trying to do the thing against that IP address, and they just don't anymore. So it could just be someone's trying to do a, a legitimate connection against something, and if it's that, like if it's just that, we're not going to make that be a malicious tag either, because it's just way too generic of, of a thing to do. So for the Zyxel one. Obviously, in there, you can see that it's doing things like it's it's trying to get to a specific endpoint, knowing that was a weak endpoint at some time. It was trying to execute commands at the system level because that's what it was. It was an injection based attack. And that's easy to write a tag for because we have a lot of specifics around that. So we go for most specific first. And if it's too generic, we just will not write a tag. We have to wait until we have that, that information to be able to put it out there, which means we will miss. We will err on the side of missing activity that could actually be lumped under a tag. Just because we don't want to overmatch. Overmatching means you can't use that, which means you have false positives, and that doesn't help you at all. So we we do our best to make sure that never happens. Okay. Um, is there documentation of the API integration architecture available? Um, they say they um, found the KB documentation. I don't know what that means, but yeah. So I, I mean, I believe it's docs that Gray Noise that I O. Um, I, I believe Brad actually uh, Brad Chipetta on our, on on our Gray Noise team. Uh, heard that whole thing. I find it to be a really great piece of information. I go there to to, to, to remember things. I forget. I forget things. Um, and like the API documentation there is great. I believe there's a link from there to all of the cool things that you can do with the open open API spec as well. So you can go there, get that. Um, if it's not there, reach out and I, I can point you to it as well. But but Brad does a great job like curating that entire site. Yep. Yeah. All right. I think that's all the questions we have right now. So. Um... Thank you all. Um, as a reminder, this is the first in a three-part series. If you reg registered for this, you're already registered for the other two. 